Okay, just this title here, Profitable Regenerative Agriculture. We obviously need to be profitable, but agriculture needs to be regener regenerative. And, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll answer, well, I'll describe what I mean by that when I get on, on, onto that. Um, it's not much point. Uh, uh, if we're going to be doing something, we need to be able to, we need to know that we can do that for at least a thousand years, otherwise we're wasting our time. If we're only going to do it for, if, if it's going to crash on us in five years, we need to find another way of doing it. Um, now, I, uh, uh, my place is uh, Central Tablelands, New South Wales, which is uh, uh, Golgong or, or north of Mudgee, east of Dubbo, around, around that, that area. Um, granite soil. It was, uh, it, our soils used to be quite acid in, in the low fives. Now it's 6.3 or so, and I'll explain what, how that's happened when I get onto the soil. We haven't put any lime on this, this place either uh, to achieve that. Um, I guess it's a similar rainfall, well, 650 more rainfall, fairly evenly distributed, a couple of thousand acres. And my son, Nick, is also on, on the place as well. Um, we have a fairly long family history. We've been there on this place since the 1860s. My great-grandfather um, uh, settled there in, in, in the 1860s. Um, we have always, well, he, he started running Merino sheep and we're still running Merino sheep. Um, he started growing wheat in, in the 1860s. Now, <laughs> how he used to grow wheat was um, I uh, used to dig, dig with a hoe, five acres with, think, think about this with, when, you're, when you're on a tractor uh, sowing paddock or ploughing. He used to dig five acres with a hoe and, 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 and so the, spread the seed by hand and he'd harvest it by hand. He needed that wheat, he needed 12 bags of wheat to be made into flour because there was nine kids in the family. And uh, so it was, it, it was actually to feed the family, not, uh, not, not to, uh, to sell. So. <laughs> It was quite interesting. What, what I found, found also interesting is digging this bloody uh, five acres with a hoe. And I asked my father about that and I said, are you sure he dug it with a hoe? And he said, yep. He said, I'll show you the hoe. <laughs> so he went and got this bloody old worn out hoe and it was a hoe, it was pneumatic. Now that answers one thing in relation, I'm going to talk about soil here in a minute. I bet most of Australia now, there's no way you dig it with a bloody hoe. Um, you may dig it with a mattock, but mostly you need a jackhammer. So his soil was obviously soft and friable um, to be able to dig it with, with a hoe and then get, get a, a, enough of a wheat crop off it to get, to get um, you know, a, a 10 or 12 or 40, 15 bags of wheat. There's a lot of misconceptions about, about soil and, and about how... Uh, we keep getting told by people that reckon they know that Australian soils uh, were, were always poor soil. Now, I'd put to you, most of us are farming on subsoil today, and that's exactly right. The, the soil was that soft, it, it, the horses used to bog in, into the soil when, they, when the early explorers went through. That soil was built by the grasslands. Actually, our soil was very, very fertile, and stress lecky. Um, he, he was a scientist and a geologist in the 1840s. He did soil tests from Tasmania to the middle of, of New South Wales. And the carbon level, well, he was they were testing organic matter. Organic matter was over 30%. Um, and was described those days, the soil was described as, as like vegetable mould, was what, how they described it, which is basically compost. So can you imagine your, our soils being like, like, a, like compost? I mean, magnificent soil. But the, the, if you relate that organic matter back to carbon, the carbon levels in the soils that he was testing was a range from 6% organic carbon to 20%. Now, 20% um, is amazing. There'd be no soils in Australia now that would test 20%. Very, very few would test 6%. Um, in fact, I don't know of any. Most of our soils test about 1%. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. Just enterprises at home. We primarily are uh, uh, sheep producers, uh, merino sheep. Um, 18 micron wool, um, so we're running about 4,000 4, merino sheep, or we, sh we shear about that many. Um, 
about a quarter of the place is cropped, wheat, oats, barley, whatever, um, and it's pasture cropped. We do a bit of cattle trading sometimes, not at the moment, or well, now might be time to buy them. <laughs> um, we also run one of, the, one of the larger Kelby studs in the world um, at home. And, but one of our enterprises at home now is harvesting and selling native grass seed. That's been made possible because of the way we've done this. We've restored gra the grassland and now we've got another enterprise. We actually make more money out of selling native grass seed than we do out of our grain sales. And the reason I'm putting that in there is that we don't, we don't need to, to think about, we, there are other ways of making money on places other than what's conventional. We don't need to throw the, the conventional traditional stuff out, but we can add, to, to add other enterprises in there. Okay. For the last 60 years, and this is basically after the Second World War, agriculture has been influenced by monoculture crops and the use of high rates of pesticides, uh, fertilisers and pesticides. And it really has been an ecological disaster. No one talks about that. We, we, get, we talk about, and this has been called the Green Revolution, about how wonderful it's been and about, uh, about how we, this is feeding the planet. But the wheels are falling off. The wheels are falling off, off everywhere around the world. Now, I spend a fair bit of time in, in other countries and talking to other farmers, and agriculture is crashing everywhere. And it's, because, it's crashing because of ecological problems. Like everyone, uh, it, the agricultural problems are not agricultural ones, they're actually ec ecological problems. Like uh, uh, poor, poor soils, insect attack, uh, or dysfunctional soils are all ecological ones, and I'll address that a bit more, more in a minute. The recommended solutions for, 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 this, for, for, for um, uh, things crashing around the world are, are often more fertiliser, herbicide and, uh, and insecticide, you know, which is basically the moron principle. Uh, <laughs> if, if a certain amount of fertiliser won't fix it, put more on. And I mean, that's what we get advised to, 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 uh, to do. Um, and it doesn't work, and it hasn't worked at home, and, and this is what I'll talk about in a minute. We rarely address the reasons why more inputs are required. That's the big one. Now, this talk is not about no inputs. It's not about, about, uh, about anything like that, but we really need to be a bit more, cl more clever about, about, about uh, uh, what we're using and why, and how much it's costing us, obviously. So, we, we get told this, we have to use high inputs to achieve good production. That's what, what we keep on being told. Um, why, why do we have to use high inputs? I'm not talking about no inputs, but what, high, but we have to use high inputs to achieve good production. Why do we, uh, why do we get told that? Or why, why well, well not, not only, well, not only we get told that, but on many of our places that's true. We, we do have to use high inputs to achieve good production. Okay, in 19, this is a, 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 um, a crop of wheat, 1930, um, 1932 I think it is, my, my, my father's standing in it. Um, fairly handy wheat crop by you know, any standards, 1930 or, or, or 2013. I might add that <laughs> we never ever get a photo taken of ourselves standing in a wheat crop that's only that high. <laughs> <laughs> and about two bags to the acre. So it was obviously one of his better crops. But what's, what's relevant here is that he di it didn't require any pesticides and only a very small amount of superphosphate to, to grow that wheat crop. Why can't we do that now? Has anyone, does anyone got an, an answer to that? Anyone here? Why, why can't we do that? Uh, you know, he, he did that in, 1930 and, and, uh, in, in the 1930s. And that's a common story. Like uh, in a lot of the northern New South Wales, in that good black country there, they, they were sowing crops without any fertiliser or anything there for years and years. And then now they're, they're putting tonnes of stuff on it. If our farms had healthy, functioning, carbon-rich soil instead of dysfunctional soil, now I might add, you know, after, after I spoke about stress lecky and that deep, deep, that deep soil, now our soils ha are basically, we're farming on subsoil. We, we've lost all that good soil. Um, if, if our farms had, had, had healthy functioning soil, we would use less fertiliser and we would have far better water holding capacity. 
and by improving the soil we'll increase crop yield and crop and pasture yields. It, it is all related to soils and, and, and how, how they function. So now in relation to that, if our farms had pastures that functioned like grasslands, we would have healthy functioning carbon rich soil. We would use less fertiliser. We would have no insect, we would need no insecticides and no fungicides. So they're interrelated. The, it's the, it, the, the, the big driver, well the driver, the driver of, of soils is, is grass or grass, uh, grass lands. And, and we need diversity of species in there to achieve that, um, uh, as many in there as possible. One of the problems in relation to this, why I'm talking about grass, now don't get too worried about grassland, I'm not talking about, uh, about just growing native grasses only, but I'm, uh, what I'll, the word function in here is the key to that, to this. We want our pastures to function like grasslands. So, and so to do that, you don't necessarily need a native plant in there, but they should be functioning like grasslands. The advice we get now, if you, you get advice on, on pastures, you'll get told that, oh, you only need one or two species in there because if you put 10 or 12 species in, 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 a, in, a, in a mix when you sow it, you'll only end up with two, so why don't you sow the two in the first place? You've probably, you've probably heard that, but all that tells you is you're not grazing it properly, you're not managing it properly. How, however, if we had a pasture, and I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, if, if our pastures function like our grasslands used to, with great diversity in there of, of plants that grow, right, uh, different species that grow at different times of the year, then we would start to get soils more like, more like that. Uh, and and, that, and that's, it, it's that simple. Plants are the things that drive all of this. And, and species diversity drive that. Species diversity will also generate profit to you and, 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 and production if you want to look at that as well. So, agriculture is crashing all over the world because it doesn't function in an ecologically sound way. That is the main problem. No one talks about ecology. No, no one talks about, about the wheels falling off things because of, 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 the, of the ecological function. And because it's not functioned soundly and e ecologically, we have reduced soil carbon levels. That is related to reduced soil moisture. If we worry about dry seasons. Um, we wouldn't have to worry anywhere near about, about uh, uh, dry seasons if we had higher carbon levels in our soils and, 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 and better structured soils. Reduced soil fertility is also related to this, and they're both together. We, we would, uh, and that's related to more artificial fertiliser. Increased insect attack is also a problem in the way we farm uh, and that needs more insect, insecticide. Crop diseases is, is also uh, yeah, an ecological problem, more, more fungicide. And modern agriculture certainly lacks resilience. Resilience was one of the main things, an ecological function. But resilience, we need our farms to bounce back after these dry times uh, or not get as far into the, or not crash as far and then bounce back, which is what re resilience is all about. We worry, if it stops raining for a couple of weeks, we, we sort of get a bit worried about that. Not only that, now, uh, what, what will start to happen if, when your soils are dysfunctional, you start to get waterlogging problems. They're all interrelated. The same thing that, that causes uh, um, uh, lack of soil moisture when it's dry is exactly the same reason why, we're getting, why we get waterlogged soils. Why do I do things differently? Um, my father, when he started, uh, he changed from horse teams in the 1920s. He did start farming with horse teams in the 1920s. He, uh, he, he, he uh, got, like most young fellows, really got, got into, into tractors in, the, in that era. He always used to brag about this, this that was a twin city, Minneapolis Moline. And he reckoned it was the best tractor in the district. <laughs> it probably was too. Um, he bought that brand new for I will test the age of people out here in a minute. It was 325 pound. <laughs> Some of you know what that means. <laughs> uh, you know, a, a nearly $700 now, uh, roughly. What was interesting about that, I did the calculations on that. He was getting one to Levman's halfpenny a bushel. Well, that doesn't mean much to you either. <laughs> Which was, it was $10 a tonne uh, for wheat. 
what was, what was interesting is that it only took 70 tonne of wheat to buy that brand new tractor in the 1930s. How many tonne of wheat does it buy, take to buy a tractor now? It's well over a thousand tonne. <laughs> it depends on how big a tractor is. Could be 2,000 tonne. Um, so times were, were good through the 1930s and 40s. That's where I'm getting at here now, like uh, on the land. Um, and, and he put a lot of land together, like uh, in, that, in that period as well. He bought, bought neighbouring places. But in the process, he, he got into cropping in a big way. Um, he actually um, started to use superphosphate in the 1930s. Um, and what's interesting is superphosphate in the 1930s was called new manure, as opposed to real manure, which was horse, horse manure or cow manure. But that's what super was, was called, new manure. What was interesting was his father and, and, and his grandfather gave him a real hard time using this new manure because they said it would poison the ground. Um, but he doubled his crop yield straight away by using, using super. But interestingly, uh, 50 years later, those two old fellows were right. That superphosphate, you, in, in large amounts at home, did a lot, did a lot of damage over a long period of time. Um, but anyway, he, he farmed continuously for, continuously for 20 years until, until uh, um, not in the 1940s, he, uh, late 1940s, he, he had a storm just about washed the whole place away. He was getting to a stage also where the place wouldn't grow any wheat anymore. And the term used then was farmed out country, but really what it meant was it was dead microbially and, and very little soil carbon in there. There was no nutrient cycling anymore. So he, he stopped growing wheat on, on that country. Well, he had to anyway, he did, had no choice. But then he set about restoring it, um, which was, which was uh, 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 really interesting. He, my father was actually a pioneer in, in that early agricultural stuff. But what happened uh, there in, in, in this is the same paddock, uh, hang on, there, there that, where he's standing there with that weed crop. This, this, uh, this photo is actually of a wedge tail eagle being shot and hung on the fence. Uh, but that's not what, what I'm looking at here. Uh, that was taken in 1939, exactly the same spot. There's that same hill there and there. And it, he had stuffed that paddock in, in, in that short period of time. Gullies through it. That gully ended up at 10 feet deep. Um, so he did a lot of damage in, in that period, but then, and he continued cropping, so at the, towards the end, he would have been in serious trouble. But he fixed, many, he, he fixed the problems that, that he created. He filled in the erosion gullies, and, and he really got into introduced pastures, uh, subclover ryegrass, and, and he, he, he uh, uh, was very much a pioneer in that area of the sub-super era, like a, a sub, sub, a super phosphate, sub-clover, rye grasses, all of that. And it worked extremely well in that era. There was absolutely nothing wrong, wrong with, with, with that. And um, so high input agricultural methods uh, were practiced at home on, uh, in that era. And I've grown up in high input agriculture. Uh, that's, that's, what I, what, that's what we did. So. And it worked extremely well. It, it, it was very productive and very profitable in this era. Like one of the reasons it was profitable, not many people realise now, superphosphate was subsidised. Government subsidies, it was very, very cheap. Um, so it, uh, we could pour heaps of fertiliser on uh, to keep the, the, these, these plants growing, get great production. Uh, wool prices were extremely good in that, that time. So everything was, was fine. Not a problem in, in that era, for, from the 1950s to the, to, to the, to the, the 70s, it, it did work extremely well. So the whole place was fertilised with 100 weight to the acre, 125 kilograms per hectare annually. Um, some of the, the paddocks have had four and five tonne of, of superphosphate put on them over that period of time. Um, obviously still ploughing and cultivating to, to sow crops. Um, but we're using higher and higher rates of fertiliser and then starting to get problems with red lead earth mite and insect attack and all of that. And, and as was that, that era, we were set stock grazing because that's what we knew. Um, now, on today's figures, if I was doing what we were doing in that era and my father was doing, it would cost over $80,000 annually with that 
with the, the superphosphate and, and, and all those high inputs, that's what it would cost now if, if I was still doing that. Um, we didn't realise at the time how much damage we were doing, but our soils were getting more and more acid. We, we, we were running into problems of sowing particular things like that, that, that weren't, weren't uh, um, uh, tolerant of acid soils. We had salinity problems uh, coming out over the place, Ver like soil structure problems, compacted soils, all of those things were happening. And, and we didn't relate it really to, to, to what we were doing. We didn't relate it to, to uh, the methods we were using of all these things crashing on us. And the place at home, it crashed earlier than most other places around us. And the reason I think as why is that my father started earlier with most of this stuff. He, he, like I said earlier before, he was a pioneer in much of this. And, and he started earlier and, and it crashed earlier as well. One of the problems we, we were running into in, 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 during the 1970s was fertiliser costs were becoming too high. We couldn't afford the, the fertiliser on the pastures anymore. And the, those government subsidies had come off also. Um, we were re sowing pastures all the time. That was very expensive. As so, we, as, uh, rainfall no longer infiltrated. Acid soil, salinity, all of that stuff. We were going broke. No, no doubt about that. So there's a desperate need to change agricultural techniques, but how do we change? And what do we change, change to? It's, you know, it's okay for someone like me to stand up here and say, you know, we need to change, but, but <laughs> what do we change to? I mean, most of the answers we're given are the same as what we've been doing before. So how and why did I change? In 1979, we had a major bushfire. I mean, <laughs> fairly serious bushfire. We lost almost all of our sheep. We had 3,000 dead sheep. The whole place is dot, dot I remember it well. Black landscape with, with dead sheep all over it. Uh, virtually no fences left. Um, took, took virtually all the fences out. No buildings left, house, shed, the whole lot. <laughs> um, and obviously no money. It, it just wiped us out totally. Um, so I, and I, I was burnt in as well. So, so um, I was trying to work out how we could survive. You know, what can we do with no money to, to, to survive? How are we going to get out of this? Um, virtually no, no sheep. Um, we did have some cattle that escaped. We, had, we used to run about 100 cows as well those days. Um, uh, breeders, uh, they escaped the fire, so we sold them and bought, bought sheep. Um, but I started to look at low input agricultural methods in, in that time. I had no choice, had no money. I, well, it was not low input, it was no input. I had no money anyway. <laughs> so, so I stopped, you, obviously the pasture fertiliser went straight away, couldn't afford that anymore. Um, and I focused on, even those days, on 100% ground cover. That's in everything, crops and pastures. I started time control uh, uh, grazing or planned grazing in the early 90s. Um, and, uh, and, and we can talk a bit more about that later. Developed pasture cropping in, in, in 93, yeah, 93, 95 actually it was. Um, but really, really think, things started to work well when, it, when we combined the two. When it started, when it combined the, 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 the grazing and the cropping together. And I focused on restoring Winona to a grassland. I focused on native grasses because I knew that they didn't need high levels of fertiliser. That's the only, only real reason. That, that, and I knew that if, if anything was going to grow there without those high inputs, native grasses would. And, and that's what, I, what actually started to return when I pulled the plug on, on the... What, what's interesting, when I stopped fertilising pastures, the things like uh, phalaris and ryegrass and many of those things, they just died. They, they, uh, uh, they, they just fell over. The native grasses loved that lack of fertiliser, or, or lower, lower phosphorus levels, and, the, and they were fine with that. Um, and, and that brings me to a point, <laughs> to a statement, we forever, we, we forever uh, grow things that want to die and kill things that want to live. I mean, that, that's pretty well, pretty well how, how our agriculture functions. We try, we try to grow this new wonderful plant the bloody thing doesn't want to live anyway, so we prop it up with everything we can throw, throw at it, even to change the soil and, fertil and, and, and soil nutrients to keep this bloody thing alive that really wants to die anyway. And, and you think, well, why do we bother <laughs> with this plant that wants to die? 
why not, why not concentrate on the things that actually want to live? Um, so that's basically what I did. I, I had no choice anyway, because uh, I had no money to prop up these things that wanted to die. So, okay, why would you bother? Why, why restore the function of a grass stand? As I was talking about this before. Native grasslands, and this also here, it, pretty well all over Australia, consists of at least 100, but most likely 200 species of warm season, cool season grasses and forbs and herbs. Warm season, uh, summer grasses, uh, grass that grow in the winter. Forbs and herbs are, are things like lucerne and clover, and I mean, they're not native, but that, the, the native version of those, like uh, glycines and desmodiums and lilies and irises and all that stuff, are basically forbs. Um, so, most pastures now consist of a, a, of a few species of cool season grass and a, leg, a, and a legume. No one in this environment has really thought about warm season grasses because we keep getting told, oh, they won't grow here. I mean, these people that make this statement, they won't grow here, don't think what the bloody all grew here 150 years ago, ago. It was dominated by warm season grasses. So why are we, why are we planting all cool season uh, pasture plants? Uh, and then wonder why we've got a summer drought. Uh, that, <laughs> um, there's some photos here that, that, that demonstrate that. Now, this is my brother's place, because he's a long way away I can pick on my brother. My brother is farming how I used to farm and my father used to farm. Might add now, because I'll use my brother's example a lot, he's a bloody good operator. He's a good operator in a, in a conventional way. So we're not comparing someone that's a bad operator here. He's, a, he's, he's, he's bloody good at what he does. Um, now, this photo is taken in, in his paddock after, uh, in, it was February, and uh, after we'd had um, 40 mil of rain. Now, through the fence, this is in, in my, my paddock here um, on the same day. Right. Now, when I went back to, uh, six weeks later, I, I, I went back to my brother's place to take the photo again. I found he'd, spray, he'd sprayed it all. And the, what he'd, <laughs> he stuffed up my photo opportunity. But what he'd sprayed were, were summer weeds, were summer, you know, cat heads and khaki weed and all those horrible things. That was what was growing there. So there was no, he, he had no value for them anyway. So he sprayed all them out. Um, and when, by the time I'd got back to, to this paddock here, the feed was nearly over the fence. Now, what we're illustrating here is not that I can grow, a bit, grow more grass uh, than, than my brother, but if you, like, that 40 mil of rain, my brother might as well have not had it at all, because what did he grow? Well, it, what, what he grew, he had, there was no value in it anyway. So all we're talking about here is, is uh, really matching, matching our pastures to our, our rainfall. And I think you can probably uh, associate with that here. Yeah, uh, if, if in the summer rain you've got here, if you, you're not getting any growth, it's not because of necessarily because of lack of rain, it's because you don't have species that will respond to that, that rainfall. The original grasslands had species that responded to every rainfall event. So in other words, our pastures need to mimic what our grasslands used to do. Um, my brother, that place there, it's got, he got plenty of feed in, in, those, in the winter months. Uh, not a problem there, like he's got pretty well, well mostly uh, uh, winter growing species, cool season grasses and clovers and stuff, um, but runs into a summer drought every year. 